Good evening. The U.S. presidential election is becoming increasingly uncivil and divisive. U.S. presidential hopeful and Republican frontrunner Donald Trump's rally at Chicago was cancelled on Friday after his supporters clashed with his critics there. A journalist at that rally was detained and accused by one of Donald Trump's supporters of working for the Islamic State, which the journalist has since vehemently denied several times. There was a trouble at Trump's Ohio public meeting meeting two on Sunday when a protester walked up to the stage before being arrested and charged. Trump later claimed that the protester was related to the Islamic State. Democrat Bernie Sanders and Republican Donald Trump have traded barbs with each other over the violence at Trump's Chicago rally, with each accusing the other of being behind the violence. The violence, threats and incendiary statements on the campaign trail raise the question, why has the campaign fallen to such lows and how will this impact the race for the White House and the American polity. So to discuss what this means for the U.S. presidential election, for Democrats, for Republicans and the people of the United States, we are joined in the studio by Meera Shankar, a former Indian ambassador to the United States of America, Professor Sriram Cholia, he is a professor and dean with Jindal School of International Affairs and Dr. Stuti Banerjee, she is research fellow with ICWA. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to DD News. Ms. Shankar, I'll begin with you. Did you ever imagine before the U.S. presidential election campaign got underway that the campaign would actually fall to such depths and we'll see supporters and critics <coughs> uh, clashing with each other at rallies? Well, one thing was very clear in the U.S. even when I was ambassador there that there was extreme political polarization. If you saw President Obama's efforts to you know, pass the budget, uh, move various bills, were all stimmied by a Republican Congress. And the ideological polarization was becoming very sharp. Of course, in this campaign, it was generally expected that by now, you know, which is middle March, uh, Jeb Bush would have tied up the mm. Republican nomination <laughs> and Hillary Clinton would have tied up the uh, Democratic nomination. Mm -hmm. But you've had uh, two insurgent candidates uh, <laughs> on both sides. One is Donald Trump, who has emerged out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And the Republican Party itself, the, the conventional leaders of the Republican Party, are extremely unhappy at Trump's rise. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, Bernie Sanders, uh, governor of Vermont, has come, and a senator, has come from the left to really um, make Hillary's uh, position, which was seen as very uh, secure, mm -hmm. uh, uh, more shaky. So you've had these two insurgent uh, candidacies. Uh, on the Democratic side, Hillary right. still is far ahead of Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. in terms of delegates pledged. Mm -hmm. I think she has more than double the number of delegates that Sanders Indeed, has. That's right. But on the uh, other side, um, you've seen that the Republicans are trying to create a coalition to head off Trump's nomination. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's even talk that if no candidate gets a majority, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the Republican primaries, mm -hmm. then uh, they would encourage the delegates, if Trump doesn't get an outright majority, then they would encourage the delegates to vote, uh, you know, individually okay. uh, in an effort to stimmy Trump. Absolutely. Now, it's interesting that you're calling uh, two of them insurgent candidates, but uh, Dr. Cholia, what do you make of uh, what is being called an uncivil war between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump? Is this unprecedented? Because some reports suggest that one should not be surprised. We've seen this in the past as well, when Ronald Reagan was running for the presidency. Yeah, but you see, they represent extreme right and extreme left. And historically, these two uh, cannot get along. And so what you're seeing is uh, on race, on class, on ideology, on all these main axes that divide society, mm -hmm. America is divided. And this uncivil behavior you're seeing now and you know, the resort to you know, violence or threats to violence have, uh, in a way, they foreshadow you know, the state of the nation. You know? And they're showing that the recovery from the economic crisis has been feeble. 
uh, people are dissatisfied at the grassroots, the anger, frustration is boiling over, and uh, the incitement also. There's, you know, especially on the Trump side, you know, they are inciting people to uh, be aggressive and to put down and to, you know, in many ways to silence critics and opponents. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a fascist uh, side to all this, mm -hmm. especially on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. So, um, and as far as Sanders, uh, uh, you know, grassroots goes, for them it's like a revolution. Whether he gets the nomination or not, this is like the best show that a socialist has ever made uh, in American presidential history. So they want to, you know, go out fighting, and go down fighting. Mm -hmm. So even though Sanders' chances against Clinton are rather marginal in the long run, he's giving her a tough fight, and they are going to use every means. So the more you show that you are up against the enemy, which is the other end of the ideological spectrum, mm -hmm. the better your chances are of being mobilizing your own flock. So it's a political polarization relies upon mm -hmm. you know defining an enemy and going after them aggressively. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that. So now that could well be the strategy uh, behind what we are seeing now. But uh, if you uh, talk to Donald Trump and he's uh, been uh, talking about this in several interviews in the U.S., he says that this shows the angst of uh, the people of the United States towards establishment politics. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with uh, that point of view? Uh, if you look at the statement that has just come out by President Obama, the joint statement between him and Prime Minister Trudeau, there is a question by one of the journalists to him about his reaction because Donald Trump has gone out of his way to say that there is this anger against President Obama and his establishment and the administration and those people who are unhappy have come out and supported him. So you have President Obama actually saying that, you know, people have blamed me for a lot of things. I've been blamed left, right, and center, but this is the first time people are actually going out and telling the president is bla to be blamed for the primaries and caucuses of a opposition party. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's actually taken and that. And also, interestingly, if I may intervene, the slogan of uh, Donald Trump mm -hmm. is make America great yes. again, and to that, Obama has said America is already great. Yes, he has <laughs> gone, and if you look at, uh, if you read his State of the Union address and the speeches that he's been giving after that, his point has been very similar, that America is great. And all these issues that Trump is bringing up are very nice, but on all of them he has, and the Democratic Party has a counters to them. So on the economic issue, he has a counter that economy is growing, that jobs are coming back into the U.S. And now you have uh, the Clinton uh, uh, campaign managers, you have Bernie Sanders' campaign going all out and proving that Donald Trump's industries actually use foreign workers. So they are now questioning him and on all of, of these. Quotes. Yeah. <laughs> so you now have a campaign which is saying that you know he's going to build a wall on Mexico with the Mexican president going fine, but we're not paying for it. Mm -hmm. You have the Mexicans saying you have a lot of Mexican Americans working in your industries. They're contributing to your economy. So where is the question of Mexicans coming and taking over things here? Mm -hmm. You have the entire issue of him saying, you know, when you do a war on terror, you have to go all out. And you have a former NSA chief saying we that if he can't... bomb the IS out is what he said. He said bomb the IS out, you're going to go after the terrorist families. Now, that is against the Geneva Convention. Mm -hmm. And you're actually going to order your military to do that. And to that, you have a former NSA coming out and saying if he becomes the president and he gives out that order, the chances are the American military is not going to so follow that. So his statements have sparked several debates. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, Ms. Uh, Shankar, would you say that uh, Trump's statements are encouraging uh, a culture of violence uh, at rallies or a culture of lies as well? Because uh, there have been several uh, statements that have been made by him, some of them Stuti referred to, and uh, there are uh, statements with regard to unemployment rate in the U.S. The official statistics say that it is around 5 percent. He claims it is 20 percent. Then there are several statements that have been contradicted by the press uh, vis a vis mm -hmm. the uh, Mexican immigrants and the like. Would you say that a culture of uh, violence and lies is being encouraged, as his critics put it? Well, certainly um, the kind of uh, very heated rhetoric that we are seeing um, is, um, is inciting people to some extent. Uh, and uh, you see Trump's uh, use of, of fear, you know, as a strategy. Fear of uncertainty because in America there is this angst that uh, you know the future may not be exactly what the American dream was in the past that every generation is going to be better off than the next generation um, though jobs have come back and uh, in fact unemployment figures are perhaps the best they've been since the 80s uh, wages are flat 
and you're seeing a shrinking middle class in America uh, with growing inequality and the top 1% cornering a lot of the benefits and advantages uh, mm -hmm. from the recovery, even though it's not been very robust. So issues of equity, issues of the vanishing middle or dwindling middle, I wouldn't say vanishing, that's too strong, and this anxiety that the future may not always or inevitably be better, then uncertainties on the global front with ISIS, you know, um, dominating uh, areas in Iraq and Syria, in Afghanistan, the Taliban showing resurgence. So there is a sense of global uncertainty as well. So there could and, be a strategy of playing on those this, fault lines. So these fears or anxieties are what Trump has tapped into, particularly anger in white lower middle class and working class voters. Mm -hmm. um, you see that in Michigan as well, right. where Hillary was uh, shown as having a 25 point lead in the polls running up. To but Sanders the, won. And then Sanders won by a mm. small margin, mm -hmm. 1.5 points, but he won. And Michigan is really white working class territory to a considerable extent. Mm -hmm. um, you also see the race factor because um, Trump has been known to have had uh, contact with, with the Ku Klux Klan. His critics call him anti-racist. Really. Well, the Ku Klux Klan uh, is a very racist organization mm -hmm. in America, and Trump had contacts with the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and um, then, uh, you know, if you see Hillary on the other hand, has got massive support okay. from African American voters. Absolutely. And so, <coughs> which is why there is this talk also of who has the demographic advantage. I have to take a break, uh, Mira Shankar, at this point in time. Sure. But uh, after the break, uh, we will continue our discussion on what really this uncivil war uh, that we are seeing playing out during the U.S. presidential campaign really means for the people of the United States, for Republicans, for Democrats, as well as for the American polity. Stay tuned. बहुत बहुत बधाई हो आपने अपने बच्चों को पोलियो से बचा लिया लेकिन जब तक दुनिया में पोलियो का एक भी केस है पोलियो का खतरा बना हुआ है इसीलिए अब सरकार देश में पोलियो इंजेक्शन की शुरुआत कर रही है ताकि आपके बच्चे को मिले डबल सुरक्षा अब अपने एक साल से छोटे बच्चे को टीकाकरण सत्र में पोलियो की तीसरी खुराक के साथ जरूर दिलवाए पोलियो का इंजेक्शन क्यूँ राधा इससे क्या होगा पता है ना हाँ दीदी पोलियो से डबल सुरक्षा हमेशा के लिए याद रहे पोलियो की तीसरी खुराक के साथ जरूर दिलवाएं पोलियो का इंजेक्शन अधिक जानकारी के लिए अपने पास के स्वास्थ्य केंद्र एएनएम या आशा दीदी से संपर्क करें मैं अमिताभ बच्चन आज आपके सामने वो कहने जा रहा हूं जो मैंने पहले कभी नहीं कहा मैं एक रोगी हेपेटाइटिस बी का रोगी उन्नीस में कुली फिल्म की शूटिंग के दौरान मेरे साथ एक दुर्घटना हुई ऑपरेशन करवाना पड़ा और मेरे शरीर में 60 बोतल खून चढ़ाया गया खून का कोई एक सैंपल हेपेटाइटिस बी इन्फेक्टेड था जो मेरे लिवर तक पहुंच गया कई सालों बाद आम जांच के दौरान जब इसका पता चला तो मुझे यह भी पता चला कि मेरा एक चौथाई लिवर ही बचा हुआ है लेकिन सही इलाज के बाद आज मैं आपके सामने खड़ा हूं और काम कर रहा हूं हेपेटाइटिस बी से बचने का पहला उपाय है शिशु के जन्म पर पहला टीका लगवाएं और पहले साल में तीन और नियमित टीके लगवाए ये आपका पहला कदम होना चाहिए मुफ्त टीकाकरण के लिए अपने पास के स्वास्थ्य केंद्र जाए और पूरी जानकारी ले देखिए ये जो हेपेटाइटिस बी है इससे हम डरेंगे नहीं लड़ेंगे किशोर अवस्था हम सब की जिंदगी का बहुत ही अहम पड़ाव होता है जिसमें हम सब बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण शारीरिक और मानसिक बदलावों से गुजरते हैं इस उम्र में खून की कमी यानी अनिमिया काफी आम है जिसके कारण 
कमजोरी चिड़चिड़ापन और थकान जैसी शिकायतें आती हैं। सप्ताह में एक बार आईएफए की नीली गोली लेना किशोर अवस्था में विकास के लिए सहायक होता है ये नीली गोली शासकीय शालाओं आंगनबाड़ी केंद्रों और शासकीय स्वास्थ्य संस्थाओं में निःशुल्क मिलती है मैं आशा करती हूँ कि आप सब किशोर और किशोरिया साप्ताहिक आईएफए की इस नीली गोली का सेवन जरूर करेंगे भारत में लगभग तीन करोड़ विकलांग जन है किंतु हमारे सरकारी भवन अस्पताल विद्यालय विकलांग जनों के लिए सुगम्य नहीं है यही हाल हमारे रेलवे स्टेशन बस स्टॉप बसों तथा रेलगाड़ियों का है हमारी वेबसाइट्स यदि डब्ल्यू थ्री सी सुगम्यता मापदंडों को पूरा नहीं करती तो वे दृष्टि बाधित और श्रवण बाधित व्यक्तियों के लिए पूरी तरह उपयोगी नहीं है आइए हम बाधा रहित वातावरण का निर्माण करें सुगम्य भारत अभियान देश का प्रत्येक विकलांग जन अन्य सामान्य व्यक्तियों के समान स्वावलंबी होकर सम्मान और गरिमा के साथ जीवन यापन करें सुगम्य भारत सशक्त भारत तुमने कहा था पैसे दोगे अंजू ये चोट कैसे लगी वो बाथरूम में पैर फिसल गया था छुपाने से कुछ सॉल्व नहीं होगा अंजू ये सब आखिर कब तक हा? कभी मायके से पैसे मंगाओ तो कभी लड़की पैदा हुई इसका ताना मैं करूँ भी तो क्या नहीं था छोड़ना मेरे घर की बात है ये तुम्हारी इज्जत की बात है अपने पति के घर में इज्जत से रह पाना तुम्हारा हक है और वो जो कर रहा है गैर कानूनी है इसकी कम्प्लेन करना जरूरी है डरो मत डोमेस्टिक वायलेंस एक्ट के तहत तुम्हारे पति को पहले वार्निंग दी जाएगी और एक प्रोटेक्शन ऑफिसर भी अपॉइंट होगा जो उसके बर्ताव पर निगरानी रखेगा इसमें काउंसलिंग इमरजेंसी में शेल्टर होम और मेडिकल की सुविधा भी है फिर भी हालात नहीं सुधरे तो घरेलू हिंसा अधिनियम 2005 के अंतर्गत आप निकटतम पुलिस स्टेशन में कम्प्लेन कर सकते हैं अगर सुनवाई नहीं होती है तो राष्ट्रीय महिला आयोग की मदद भी ले सकते हैं घर के अंदर होने वाले जुल्म को छिपाओ मत बल्कि आवाज उठाओ आप सब ने दुनिया भर में क्या मिसाल बनाई है जिस सफाई से आपने कचरा वहीं फेंक दिया और मन्नू आंटी क्या कूड़ा फेंकती हैं? ओलंपिक्स के गोला फेंकने वाले भी शर्मा जाए और ये देखिए लक्ष्मी भाभी की सफाई तो गांव गांव में प्रसिद्ध है हमारे सुखिया भैया मन की करते जहां सोचा वहीं शौच कर दिया ये देश जो आप ही का घर है उसे क्यों गंदा करते हैं थोड़ी शर्म कर लो सोच स्वच्छ कर लो अगर एक बार सवा सौ करोड़ देशवासी तय कर ले कि मैं गंदगी नहीं करूंगा तो दुनिया की कोई ताकत नहीं है जो हिंदुस्तान को गंदा कर सकती स्वच्छ भारत एक कदम स्वच्छता की ओर Welcome back. We are discussing tonight the impact of falling uh, campaign rhetoric on the prospects of U.S. presidential hopefuls and for the American polity. And uh, we are continue to be joined by Meera Shankar, Dr. Suti Banerjee, and Dr. Sri Ram Cholia. Dr. Cholia, while uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, Donald Trump are actually crossing swords over the cancellation of Trump's uh, Chicago rally. Two primary results uh, came in, uh, one of Washington and the other of Wyoming. And uh, to the surprise of some, Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio won those two primaries. So was that unexpected lines? See, Ted Cruz uh, is still very much in contention. Uh, he's second in terms of delegates. He's also an anti-establishment candidate, although not as wacko as uh, Donald <laughs> Trump. So um, it's possible, I mean, the more you visualize him, it's possible that he may get the nomination eventually in three to four months. Because uh, when you were betting on Marco Rubio earlier, I was. I thought he was a dark horse because he's the mainstream candidate. He's, you know, the closest to the center and is more acceptable to the Republican Party, big wigs, and the establishment. But it looks like the sentiment of the voters is so much. It's like throw the rascals out kind of mode. You know, right now they're totally against the party uh, establishment, and therefore Rubio's star seems to be fading. But Ted Cruz is very much in there, and I think if he pulls off 
a couple of big wins. Uh, I think if it is one on one between Ted Cruz and uh, Donald Trump, in terms of argumentation, in terms of policy expertise, in terms of authenticity, I think he will be the clear uh, winner. So in the long run, uh, Hillary Clinton versus Ted Cruz uh, presidential race will be interesting because Cruz is younger. He's uh, you know he could break Hillary Clinton's Hispanic uh, constituency. There are so many factors that go into uh, you know eventually who will vote in November, and maybe there is an anti-incumbency factor against the Democratic White House. Mm -hmm. So it's possible. But if Trump gets it for whatever you know as the you know the miracle has been going on, even though people have predicted <laughs> that it is just a temporary okay. you know phenomenon. Right. If Trump gets it, then absolutely. you know I think Clinton will carry through easily. Absolutely. I want to talk about the Super Tuesday too, but before that, just a quick comment on do you expect sanity to return to the uh, presidential election campaign or is it going to get worse from here on? Because there are some reports that suggest that left and liberal elements are actually girding up to uh, attack uh, uh, Donald Trump's events in future. Uh, depends on how we would define sanity. But yeah, I think that the campaign is now going to, uh, we're going to see more rhetoric from Donald Trump. We're going to see him going out all attacks mode. He has, uh, some would say that um, the, the latest attacks on him in person, especially one of the um, people actually coming up near to him Ohio, on the stage in meeting. Ohio. So that has kind of rattled him up a bit. But then now, till now he has built up this persona of being this macho man who's going to take everything forward and is going to make America great. And he has continuously said that because he does not have the support of anybody except he's pumping in his own money, so he is the ultimate candidate. I think he now cannot leave that image behind, so he has to take that forward. Uh, on the <coughs> other hand, Sanders has been one of those people who has been quiet and steady in the race. So I think both of them have that image that they are projecting. They've carried it too far away to now just let go of it. <laughs> and it is something which is appealing to their voters. So mm -hmm. I think they're going to stick to that line and we're going to see more of this mudslinging happening, okay. in my opinion. Now, uh, uh, Ms. Shankar, some are saying that uh, Trump is making it easier for Hillary to make it to the White House. Do you agree with that view? that he's wrecking the Republican Party? Well, the Republican Party has never been so divided as today. I mean, you, you have this spectacle where Republican leaders are actually strategizing on how to head off a Trump victory. Mm -hmm. So that is something really new because, you know, in, in, it's also surprising on many issues, Trump's position really upend Republican positions over the years. So for instance, he used to be a supporter of pro-choice on abortion. He's now, of course, switched to pro-life, but his traditional position was pro-choice. On trade, the Republicans have always been the strongest proponents of free trade, but Trump is totally protectionist in his rhetoric and says that these free trade agreements have really hurt America and jobs have gone to other countries and he is going to fight and get back those jobs and you know take on he's blamed you know, india china, and china for taking away american china, jobs china mexico india figures occasionally mm -hmm. china and mexico predominantly, uh, uh, predominantly. Um, so if you take a look at trump's whole candidature i mean it it really upends many well known republican positions and um, the kind of rhetoric that he is spewing, uh, some of it quite irresponsible. For instance, like we will go after the families of the terrorists or we will bomb. We won't I allow ISIS. Muslim immigrants um, into the country. Conveys an impression of, or that we will not allow Muslims to enter the country, mm -hmm. uh, quite ignoring you know, the large Muslim population within the United States. And also uh, the U.S.'s allies like Saudi Arabia or other countries in the Gulf. So um, I think the mm -hmm. Republicans really feel that he conveys an impression of somebody who's a maverick, brash, and um, irresponsible. It portrays the party as irresponsible. So there is this effort to try to stimmy mm -hmm. a Trump presidency, but it's been left very late. Now they have all these attack ads, mm -hmm. you know, negative ads against Trump. Mm -hmm. We have to see, because you're seeing already in Wyoming and Washington, D.C., that he's done quite badly, okay. one having been won by Ted Cruz, the other by Marco Rubio. Yes. But Florida, from the polls, he seems still to be ahead. Yes.
he is enjoying a lead there. But uh, what do you think is at stake for Republicans and Democrats as far as the five big primaries on Super Tuesday 2 is concerned? Is there more at stake for Republicans and Democrats? Well, more people, it's like a winnowing process. As the third, fourth, fifth place, uh, you know, contenders will start dropping out, and already some have dropped out. So I'm expecting, you know, that maybe Rubio be, could be next. It, it could be. It could mm -hmm. be like a two-man race uh, in the next couple of months, you know, as it clears. But nonetheless, I mean, if you look at the larger picture, what it shows is no matter who wins the presidency, these protest candidates have made their, you know, point, which is that it cannot be politics as usual. And in a way, it's in a in a strange way, extreme left, extreme right are calling back for a kind of a re-democratization of the American polity, which seems to have gotten into elite hands, you know, the excess concentration of wealth, the, you know, the uh, inaccessibility of leaders to the general public. Mm -hmm. So in a way, after a rather successful presidency of Obama, we are likely to get a president who will be under pressure to, you know, conform to the anger and the mood at the grassroots. So I think it, there's a lot of healing process that will be required after this very, very bruising electoral battle. Okay, and a couple of statements would want you to give your last word on uh, whether you expect, uh, you know, uh, this uh, Super Tuesday 2 to be a referendum on Donald Trump and his uh, style of politics or not. I don't think it's going to be a referendum on Donald Trump or his politics, but it would be a very interesting um, election because now you're coming to a stage where the Republicans don't really want him to win but he's winning so you want you now are looking at an American public which is going to essentially decide whether the Republican Party uh, the establishment wins or the outsiders win so it's no longer Democrat versus Republican it's first within the Republicans and then Democrats versus the Republicans and for the Democrats it's they've I think they're probably thanking their stars that they just have two candidates <laughs> who more or less seem to have a civilized debate going on between them. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Meera Shankar, Dr. Stuti Banerjee, and Dr. Sriram Jolia, for having joined us for this discussion tonight. Well, all eyes will now be on the five major U.S. states that will vote on Tuesday. Ohio, Florida, Illinois, Missouri, and North Carolina will vote in both Republican and Democratic contests. Stakes are high for all the four Republican contenders, whereas Super Tuesday 2 will have only limited impact on the Democratic race. The question that results will answer is, will it be a referendum on a divisive style of campaign? And one of the guests in the studio said that uh, we will know essentially later whether uh, the outsiders will win or uh, those pro-establishment in the Republican Party will win. On that note, we conclude. Thanks for watching.